Welcome, everybody. Um, this is the first, uh, we're, kind, we're, we're calling this lecture series uh, Science Talks, and uh, welcome to the first one. Um, we, uh, we plan to have three more uh, this academic year, and uh, you'll be seeing emails, uh, uh, flyers around campus. The next one this semester is on uh, Monday, November 5th, uh, and Dr. Greg Forbes is going to talk about species conservation. So um, same time, same place, all right? Uh, so uh, our presenter today is uh, Dr. Lauren Wolsey, and uh, 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 Lauren is from, uh, well, she got a bachelor's degree, excuse me, in astronomy and physics from the University of Maryland uh, College Park, and uh, a master's and a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from Harvard University. Uh, and um, that holds a special place in my heart. I didn't go there, uh, but um, it, it's a great university, and um, we're uh, obviously uh, really glad to have Lauren here at GRCC. Uh, I was looking on the website uh, for information uh, about Dr. Wolsey, and uh, this was a quote that I read uh, on the physical sciences page. It said, I'm looking forward to my time at GRCC because I enjoy sharing my passion for astronomy with others. And so today I think uh, we'll get a little bit of that passion uh, as she presents to us. So uh, as you can see, her talk is titled Unlocking the Sun, Spectroscopy in the 1800s. So uh, take it away, Lauren. Thanks, thanks Perfect. again. Thank you, Tim. Can everybody hear me? I should have the mic on. Good in the back? Awesome. Thumbs up. That's always good. Yes, so um, there's always too much information to ever convey in a single class in a single semester. Uh, and so just trying to narrow down all of the interesting things in astronomy um, is always impossible. But this is actually one of my favorite pieces of um, astronomy history. Uh, I spent my whole um, grad school career studying the sun and studying um, what goes on in the corona of the sun. And a lot of that comes from the early research that was started in the 1800s. And so that's going to be our little glimpse into the past um, that we're going to focus on. The talk should be about half an hour, and then I want to leave plenty of room for questions at the end. OK. So 1800s means we've got a couple of key figures in our, um, in our discussion. So this is an outline of the talk, as well as a timeline of what we're um, focusing on. So the very first thing I want to cover is the fact that all of the um, terms and ideas that we're going to be focusing on comes down to understanding what light is, what different type of light exists, and what we mean by the term spectrum. And so we're going to focus on that, as well as introduce the people who helped us understand all of that. We'll then get into what spectroscopy is and how it was used to figure out certain things about the sun. And the fact that spectroscopy helped us ask even more questions about what's going on with the sun uh, and the solar corona. And so this is from uh, XKCD. So we've got lots of lines. The key thing about spectroscopy is that each one of these dark lines is related to a particular element in the periodic table. And then, of course, those giant sunglasses. Who knows what they're made of? OK. So we start our story in the 1800s, at the very start of the 1800s. So Isaac Newton was the very first person to ever um, shine light through a prism and think about the fact that it broke up into different colors, into a rainbow. Uh, but Isaac Newton's is from the 1600s, so we ignore him. Okay? William Herschel was the first person to realize that, OK, there is that rainbow there, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. But William Herschel figured out that that's not the only thing that's there. If you split light up, there's actually more than just what the eye can see. So William Herschel was trying to figure out, his initial experiment was to figure out if the different colors had different temperatures. Because early on, when Isaac Newton was first doing this, he was thinking, OK, light is made of particles, and each of the different colors is a different particle. William Herschel's trying to figure out if there's something different about the temperature of these, these colors. And what he found was that the thing that thermometers measure, it was going up higher and higher temperature as we went from purple to red. And that if he kept moving the um, thermometers past the red, they went up even more. And so he discovered the first piece of 
the full spectrum of the types of light, the first piece that isn't visible light. And so he called it infrared. And it's what we know today as um, sort of thermal radiation. Humans produce a lot of it. When you turn on the bathroom sinks uh, with your hands, it's not magic. It feels like magic. It's not magic. It's infrared radiation that it's um, catching. And so he was the first person to add something beyond that rainbow. OK. So now we start to have a better sense that there's more out there that we don't know about. And Carolyn Herschel um, was also part of this whole process. She's often cut out of history books, but it's worth making sure we understand that, first of all, she was given a telescope from her brother in the 1780s. And she discovered on her own many different comets and was the first and only woman to do so in 200 years span of time. Um, and she was very likely involved in that same discovery. It's just that you know, some people get written out of history, but we want to make sure we understand that, that she's there. OK. So now we've got not just the visible spectrum, but William Herschel discovered this piece. Okay? Since we're stuck in the 1800s, we're not going to go through all the different discoveries of all the pieces of um, the electromagnetic spectrum. But I do want to make sure that we understand um, what's here so that when those terms come up again or if you've heard them in different contexts, that we, that we recognize them briefly. So what we're looking at at the very top is all of the different types of light that exist. And they're organized. At the very top, we're looking at numbers that are measured in hertz. That's frequency, where the frequency numbers are getting higher to the left. And the bottom numbers here are wavelength measured in meters, and they're increasing from left over to right. And there's a clear um, equation that connects frequency and wavelength based on the speed of light. Everything travels at the same speed. For our talk, we're not going to worry about gamma rays. Those come from all of these exciting chemical um, nuclear reactions. X-rays, you go to the doctor, those uh, big lead vests that they put on you, that gives you a sense that that side of the spectrum is where we have higher energy types of light. So gamma rays, you think gamma radiation, you don't want to turn into the Hulk. Gamma rays seem bad, OK? Dangerous side of the spectrum. Infrared, that's what we produce. So hopefully it's not dangerous if we're making a whole bunch of it. We, sh we glow in the infrared. So what we're going to focus on is just these three, because those are the ones that the sun makes a lot of. Ultraviolet, that's why you wear sunscreen. So that also gives you a sense that it's still the um, dangerous side of the spectrum. If you don't wear sunscreen, you get a sunburn. That's no good. And that comes from the fact that that type of light has more energy per piece. OK, we have the visible spectrum. Purple has the most energy. Red has the least energy. And then infrared was that piece that um, Herschel added to us. OK, great. We have this beautiful rainbow. Nothing is missing. That looks wonderful, except we do have pieces missing when we actually look at the sun's um, rainbow. If you shine light through a prism and you can split it enough and you're paying attention, you can actually tell that there are, in fact, colors missing. And so Wollaston in 1802 was the very first person to notice that there were, in fact, colors missing, that there were these dark, dark lines. Um, so if we look here at the very bottom of the slide, it'll be on most of the slides. There are pieces that are actually fairly um, thin and hard to tell that they're there. With his experiment, if you note the darkest seven lines, those are the only ones he was able to see. And so he noted that there were these, and he labeled them A, B, C, D, and so on. And this is when we start to think about the fact that the sun is making light, but some of it isn't getting through to us. OK. So in order to understand what's going on here, we need a little bit of primer on what, what we're talking about, this process of light missing. So there are different types of spectra that we might see. If you're looking at a perfect rainbow, you get what's called a continuous spectrum in the bottom left corner of the slide. And nothing is missing. If you're looking at a um, incandescent light bulb with that heated piece of metal, you get all of the colors. It's this beautiful continuous spectrum, and everything's great. But what happens is if that continuous spectrum passes through a cloud of gas, depending on what stuff is in that gas, the atoms and molecules in this gas, and we're going to focus on atoms for now. The atoms have electrons going around them that are in different energy levels. And we can think about this, these energy levels like a, a ladder. 
if you send the right amount of energy to those electrons, they'll jump from one lower rung of the ladder up to a higher rung of the ladder, and they'll steal that energy. But if we think about a ladder, we can't put our foot in between two rungs of a ladder. We can only ever step on the physical pieces that are there, which means that all the light that's shining through will only interact with the specific energies that are any gaps in our ladder to go from the bottom rung to the second rung, or the bottom to the third, or the second to the third, all of those combinations, each one of those is one of these lines. So if we're looking through that cloud, we should be seeing all of the rainbow, but those electrons, they stole it. They're higher up on their ladders now. But electrons are lazy, okay? They wanna go home, sit on the couch, do nothing at all. They don't wanna be high up on that ladder. On their own, they will go back down the ladder. They will go from those higher rungs all the way to the bottom, or part way down, and then later to the bottom. And so those same steps that they took to go up, they take to go back down again. And so the same lines that are missing here, if we're looking and we don't see that background source, okay, the, the light bulb is no longer in our field of view, we just see those electrons getting lazy and going back down to their lower rungs, then we see the pieces of energy that they give back as they go down to their rungs. So this type of spectrum is what, if we go back a page, that's what Wollaston was seeing. He was seeing what's called an absorption spectrum. The sun is making all of this type of light, but along the way, there is stuff in between us that is stealing some of those colors. And so we're getting a continuous spectrum with these dark lines, and we're gonna call that absorption. The electrons absorbed that energy, they stole it, and now it's missing. We will, later in the talk, and I'll bring this back when we need it, we will talk about emission spectra, the fact that if we're looking in a different perspective, we can see all of that energy that the electrons gave back, they emitted, got rid of all that energy. Okay, so our brief primer on types of spectra. Okay, so we've made it through a whole decade and some, okay, we're on a roll. 1814, Joseph Fraunhofer is a name that is really well associated with the solar spectrum. For anyone who is a little bit familiar with this history, Wollaston might not have been a name that you've heard before, but Fraunhofer might be. So he was the first to create a really um, detailed and uh, accurate and precise spectroscope. So that term spectroscope means it's a fancy device that you get to shine light through, the prism's there to break it up, and then you have a way to, to look at that broken up spectrum. So rather than just the seven lines that Wollaston saw, because he was just shining it through a spectrum and seeing, yeah, there's kind of dark lines there, Fraunhofer, with his more detailed and precise um, tool, was able to see hundreds of lines. And so like Wollaston, he tried to match what Wollaston had done. He labeled the sharpest lines with letters. We're gonna go alphabetical and we have to pick one of the sides. He started with red and went that way. So A is the dark, dark line here in the red. B is the next dark line and so on. What he also noticed, and so here's A, B, C, and D. He noticed that the line that Wollaston had called D about a decade ago is actually two lines very, very close together. That very, very close together line is something that chemists at the time knew about from burning pieces of sodium um, under a flame, where what chemists were seeing was a bright flash of that yellowish um, light when they burn sodium. We go back to that idea, briefly, of absorption and emission. The sun, if there's sodium in between the core of the sun and us, sodium will steal those lines. If we're just in a laboratory with our piece of sodium that we're gonna burn, then sodium can create this amount of, these sets of lines of energy for us. So chemists were seeing this in their lab, and astronomers were seeing this from sunlight. Okay, so we have this connection now that this is the, this is the first time really when there's been that bridge that when we see something with dark lines missing, it's possible to connect it with experiments that have those line spectrum, the emission spectrum um, shown to us. 
So this is a stamp from um, the German Post that is highlighting the fact that this was a really big discovery. They made a whole stamp on it. Someday, I hope I get a stamp, right? Um, but we get all these different named lines. D is here, just like we thought it was. It's also showing us this background um, shape here. What that's showing is the amount of light that the sun is making at all of those different colors. The sun looks yellow to us because it makes a lot of yellow light. This isn't perfect. The sun actually makes more green than anything else. But it gets swamped out by somewhat equal amounts of red and blue. And so overall, the sun looks yellow to us. It makes a lot of yellow and green light. OK. So we've made it through 1814. And now we want to think about the fact that, sure, the sun is a star. And we've got, we went from seven lines to hundreds. If we look at what we can do now, we can see a whole lot in this spectrum. So this is a spectrum of the sun. You need to read it kind of like a book. So the very first row, you read left to right. And those are the, the very beginning of the visible part of the spectrum. And you keep reading across. That very, very dark line up here in the red, that's one of those named um, seven original lines. This pair right here is now that sodium doublet that's been blown up a little bit. And we see, first of all, the ones that were obvious to Wollaston way back in 1802, those are actually much thicker than a lot of the other lines. That's why they were so visible to him. And some of them are thin, barely visible. So there's something going on with that that we'll sort of set off to the side for now. But what we see is there's a whole lot that we can look at. And without something to match it to, it's just sort of a pattern of a bunch of different lines that we'll set aside for the moment. What Fraunhofer did was not only did he look at the sun, but I mentioned that it was an astronomical spectroscope. So the sun is a star. Hopefully that's not news to anybody. The sun is a star. Fraunhofer looked at other stars too. So he looked at the moon. So that's not a star. Sorry. I know. The moon has exactly the same spectrum as the sun. Oh, wait. The moon is just reflecting sunlight. OK. He was double checking. All right. So the moon, the spectrum would look like this if you look at the bright side of the moon, because it's just a big mirror, and it's showing us that same stuff. There's no air on the moon to add any more lines. He looked at Mars and Venus. He found exactly the same thing. We have to remember, Mars and Venus look bright in our sky if we see them because of reflected sunlight. OK. So he noticed, he noticed with the moon, Mars, and Venus that everything looks exactly the same. And so he's like, OK, what can I do next? He went to some of the brightest stars in our sky. Now, if we think about it, as we go from the sun, big ball of light in our sky, very bright, very big in our sky, that's easy to do, shine it through um, the tools. It is much harder to try to get, well, the, the moon is about the same size, but less bright. Mars and Venus are much smaller things in our sky, and so that gets tougher to do. And then stars are tiny, tiny points of light very far away, and not all that bright. Our night sky is dark. It's not light, but it does have those pinpoints of light. And so it took quite a lot of sort of very careful setup um, to be able to point directly at a single star and get that light through it in the 1800s. And so he looked at some of these named stars. If stars have fancy names and not weird catalog names, it means that they're very bright. Sirius is the very brightest star in our whole sky. Betelgeuse is a very big, orangey-looking star. All of these other stars. And what he found was that they all looked very similar to the sun, but not identical. Not identical the way the moon, Mars, and Venus were. And so what he found was sometimes the stars had darker lines when the um, sun did not. Sometimes they had lines that almost barely showed up in the sun at all, or lines that were here that weren't in the sun, things like that. And there's a clear trend there. He didn't know what the trend was, but there's a clear trend. Now, we go back to this idea. If we're looking at those stars and we're seeing different lines missing or new lines that weren't there missing, what that's telling us is that there's different stuff that that star is actually made of or that that star has a lot of. The fact that when we look at all of these different stars, the letters I don't think I get to in this class, uh, in this class. I know, I'm used to a certain thing, right? 
These letters come from a very uh, interesting part of um, astronomy that I may get to in the slides, I may not. If not, I can always answer questions about them afterwards. But this is showing stars from the very, very hottest stars at the top of the slide to the very, very coldest stars at the bottom of the slide. And there are trends here. Our sun is a G2 star, so somewhere in between G0 and G5. But they all have roughly the same set of lines. They're all made of roughly the same stuff. So same lines, maybe different amounts, but same general stuff. OK, so we've made it halfway through the century, 1859. Gustav Kirchhoff is known for a lot of different things in physics. But one of the things that um, Kirchhoff did was, first of all, Robert Bunsen, Bunsen burner. He had perfected this new laboratory burner that would able that would allow you to um, burn a piece of a particular element and see what um, it looked like. Kirchhoff set up an experiment that basically brought in sunlight from the outside and had it so that he could sort of look at them roughly simultaneously with a um, emission spectrum from a particular element that was being burned in the lab at that point. So Fraunhofer started this idea that we could say sodium is responsible for this one right here. And Kirchhoff tried to then set up a much more specific set of experiments to see how many of those lines we could actually identify. So the experiment kind of looked like this, where there's the Bunsen burner is burning a piece of a particular element, a known element, and shining light onto um, the central box. And sunlight is coming through a different um, direction, and we can sort of compare where they overlap. What lines that are missing from the solar spectrum can be explained by that particular element? So in the publication that he did, Kirchhoff noted that Fraunhofer's lines, they are things in the sun that we have here on Earth. So his quote, they exist in the consequence of the presence in the incandescent atmosphere of the sun of those substances which in the spectrum of a flame produce bright lines at the same place. He's saying that we see the emission spectrum in the lab, and we can say what things the sun is made of because those dark lines are missing in the same spot. So in the publication that he had, he identified sodium, iron, calcium, magnesium, copper, zinc, nickel, and others, they were all elements that were found on Earth. And now we have a sense that they're part of the sun, too. So that was, that was excellent work and a very, very key step in this idea of unlocking the sun. But all we've done so far is just say, yep, the sun is made of similar stuff that the Earth is. Good. That's probably uh, a useful thing. What we can do is we can look back at the spectrum where we aren't going to have that whole page of um, lines, but just the most um, obvious ones, including the lettered ones back from Wollaston's time, 1802, and that um, Kirchhoff included as well. And we can go through and figure out which ones um, they belong to. What we're doing is saying, OK, sodium makes this pattern of lines. Lines that are at that exact color, they're from sodium. Hydrogen makes this set of lines in the visible. If they're right at that color, then they're hydrogen. And we can see this line right here that's in the sort of uh, mid-reds, that is this C line here. And so on our list, we have hydrogen uh, in that spot, because that's what it is. Same idea here, the F line that's in that greenish-blue boundary, that greenish-blue boundary, we can identify that as hydrogen. So we go through this process, and we find that actually some of those lines are because we have an atmosphere. We're breathing in all that air, right? Our atmosphere is stuff in between the core of the sun and us. So we can figure out what the sun is made of and what's in our atmosphere. So we figure out that some of those aren't the sun. They're just terrestrial lines, Earth-based lines. OK. So in the 1860s, Bunsen and um, uh, Sir Henry Enfield Roscoe went through and said, OK, we're figuring out the sun. That's great. But we like astronomy. We like um, different things. And this whole list, it's impossible to see on the, um, the tiny things. There'll be a uh, 
chance for me to show the links uh, and possibly send these slides along to anyone who's interested. But on the far left, it's all of the different things that they looked at, including, I'm just going to point out this one, a nebula. So that is a cloud of gas in space, a cold cloud of gas in space. So there's no light bulb that's heating it up that we're looking through. Instead, it's just atoms of a particular element that were high up on their um, rungs and then drop back down again. And we get an emission spectrum from clouds of gas in space. So all these different things. And this is really when we're developing astrophysics as a field. The 1800s was really when we went from just looking at stuff through a telescope, astronomy, to being able to do detailed analysis of what we're seeing, astrophysics. So both of those fields are important. And this really is when we started to develop this, this sort of branch. OK. Astronomy is the oldest science that exists. Astrophysics is, is not as young, or it's not as old. OK. So great. We connected all those things, right? So talk's over, right? No. OK. The physicist and the chemist have brought before us a means of analysis that if we were to go to the sun and to bring away some portion of it and analyze them in our laboratories, we could not examine them more accurately than what we can by this new mode of spectrum analysis. Great. We have figured out what the sun is made of. We're done. We can go home, get our Nobel Prize, right? OK. Maybe not. The sun is really complicated, OK? This is the sun, gorgeous sun, OK? This bottom part of the picture here is taken in um, visible light, just get, getting all of the visible light, a continuous spectrum, or a continuum spectrum, rather. Each one of these slices is taken by a spacecraft of a particular wavelength of light. Now, what we see here is a lot going on, right? This whole picture could just be a talk all on its own. What I want to point out is that if we look closely, and this is something that would have been impossible to do in the 1800s, OK? Seeing most of this type of light requires going out into space, because it's blocked by our atmosphere, right? We, we put on sunscreen for the stuff that doesn't get blocked, but we really hope that most of it gets blocked. These loops of material we can see tell us that there's something far more exciting than just the disk of the sun being a ball of plasma and done with it. In the 1800s, they did know that there was more than just that disk of the sun. They didn't have spacecraft, but they did have, with enough patience, uh, eclipses. So how many of you were able to see the partial eclipse from last year? Some people, maybe even total, right? I went down to Tennessee. I saw the total solar eclipse. I didn't take this picture because I don't have these Photoshop skills. This is a real picture, but at each distance away from the sun, it's been enhanced so that you can see the color. It, it tails off in how bright it actually is leaving the sun. But this is a real picture um, from that eclipse. And what we see is, first of all, there's this sort of reddish stuff. That's something that was known about in the 1800s. That's the, called the chromosphere. Chromos from the Greek for color. It has some color there. And what we also see are these big lines coming out near the top and the bottom of the picture. And these bigger um, structures here on either side um, towards the middle of the sun. What we're looking at in this picture, so we have the chromospheres, the little tiny uh, pink parts. Everything else here is the corona. So we mentioned that term. I mentioned that term that that's really what I focused on for my research, is thinking about the corona and specifics of it. You could study the corona in the 1800s if you waited for a solar eclipse. They're fairly rare. There's roughly zero to two every year. And you have to be in the right part of the globe to be able to see it. We were nice and lucky here um, last year. 2024, plan to drive down to Ohio. We're going to see another one. It'll be great. But We've been pretty lucky um, to have that, that pair of eclipses. It takes a big expedition in the 1800s to go to one of these and actually get anything from it. So 1868, um, we are doing one of these things. Well, there's lots of um, these expeditions going on. 1868, there was an expedition. But J. Norman Lockyer was like, I don't want to go chasing solar eclipses. That sounds like a lot of work. He actually commissioned a spectroscope, so he worked with um, an instrument maker, that could study the corona without waiting for a solar eclipse. 
So it's, it's hard to do and you sort of have to block the, the rest of the disk of the sun and just get the um, piece away from it. Very, very hard to do, but he was able to. And on October 20th of that year, he made an observation of an emission line. Now again, emission line means we're not seeing stuff missing. That's an absorption line. He was seeing a line of light coming from this part here. So this part is not a, um, we're not looking through to see a continuous spectrum. We're seeing hot gas that is making an emission spectrum. And so Lockyer was the first one to identify this brand new yellowish orange emission spectrum. Okay? That same exact year, Pierre Janssen um, went to India in August of that year to for a solar eclipse to get measurements by taking a regular spectroscope and just pointing it at the bright stuff once the disk of the sun was covered up by the moon. And fairly amazingly, time-wise, the exact same day that Lockyer was um, giving all of his results at the Royal Society in England, Pierre Janssen's um, letter about his expedition had just gotten to the French Academy, like within a within 24-hour period. And he had seen that exact same yellow-orange line. So they both get credit for it. And we set aside what it is. We just know that we've seen it. Okay? We don't know what it is yet. 1869, the very next year, so we're, we're still trying to do all of this, and uh, there was a solar eclipse in the United States, and so we get to get some US uh, astronomers in here. William Harkness and Charles A. Young both separately observed the same eclipse, same kind of idea, sending light through this spectroscope to figure out what lines we can see, and they found a very bright green emission line. Now, I'm giving away the punchline here at the, the end. That bright yellow line from 1868, that was helium. Okay, if we go back and we see all of this uh, beautiful corona, if you see a brand new line no one has ever seen before, you have to call it something, okay? And so if you see it in the sun, maybe you name it after the Greek sun god. And so helium is the only element on our whole periodic table that was discovered not on Earth. It was discovered through this method. Now, they discovered this new line. They named it helium. And helium was eventually discovered on Earth. I think it was actually discovered in um, lava. I don't remember um, exactly. But it basically, because helium, if we think back to chemistry way back in high school, right? the helium's on that uh, very far side of the periodic table in all of the noble gases. Noble gases mean they don't care about anybody else. They're very hard to actually burn in a lab, which means all of the noble gases on the periodic table, they hadn't been researched the way that all of the rest of those um, had been in this time period, in this era, uh, where we're burning stuff with our Bunsen burner and seeing what happens. Helium hadn't, been, uh, hadn't done that because it's hard to undergo um, the same kind of chemical reactions. And so we found trapped helium as a gas. We figured out what it was. That's a whole separate story that I don't have the expertise to tell. But we figured out, OK, that yellow-orange emission line, it matches a helium emission line. That problem is solved. But even that, after that whole process, that new bright green emission line, that was still a mystery. No one knew what that one was. And so we get all the way to the idea of emission lines again where we're looking at the corona, this gas that has to be excited, so it's hot gas, and it has to send out those emission spectra. That's what we're seeing with that bright green line. If we actually want to know what that looks like, if we take a picture of the sun during an eclipse, and that's what that top um, thing is, we can uh, separate that whole picture uh, in through the same kind of thing, through a prism, to get all of the different colors separated. That's what we see at the top. We see that, OK, sure, there's this big circle of yellow because the sun picture that we were spreading out was a circle. So this is bent so that there are actual lines at wavelengths. We see a couple of things. First of all, we see that very, very bright yellow-green, or sorry, orange-yellow emission line. 
That is, no, that far one, the um, emission line. That is helium. And then bright green emission line, I think it's this one. I don't remember the numbers. That one is what they were seeing in those other eclipses. So what we have to do is figure out, okay, what do we call this brand new thing again? So we called the other one helium, Greek for helios. That sounds great. We'll call this one coronium because we saw it in the corona. Okay, so helium and coronium, great. We've got two new elements, that's exciting. Wait a second. If we think back to that high school chemistry, there is no coronium on the periodic table, right? But it's the end of the 1800s, right? So in 1896, as to the substance which produced the line that we have no knowledge as yet, the name coronium has been provisionally assigned to it, and the recent probable identification of helium in terrestrial minerals gives strong hope that before long we may find coronium also. Okay, so end of the 1800s, I guess my talk's over. No, it's not. An epilogue, 1939. So it takes 40 years for anyone to deal with this. A spectroscopist was able to figure out that coronium is an incredibly high ionization state of iron. So iron uh, 14 in Roman numerals, if you use that system, iron 13 plus. What that means is iron has had 13 electrons stripped away through ionization which requires incredibly, incredibly high temperatures. So awesome, we know what it was. Oh good, that, that was in fact helium that first time. Uh, I corrected myself incorrectly. And then here's that iron line that they were seeing. Okay, so great, we don't have to add coronium to the periodic table, where would we put it? It's iron, but it's iron that only can exist if we're at millions of degrees in temperature. And that mystery of how the corona is able to be millions of degrees in temperature is a mystery that is still around today. That's what I spent all of that time in grad school thinking about. The surface of the sun is about 6,000 Kelvin, 5,800 Kelvin. And if you think about how the sun makes energy, it's at the very core. You can take my astronomy class and figure out how. But as we get further and further out from that energy source, in the same way that you can take your hand away from a stove or back away from a campfire, it should get colder and colder as you go away. This is saying, OK, up to the surface of what we call the surface of the sun, not really a surface, but that's for the astronomy class, we're at 6,000 Kelvin. But right above that, when we get to the corona, we jump up to millions of degrees in temperature. Part of the answer in terms of how to even reconcile that in our brains is to realize that temperature really tells us how fast stuff is moving. That's what temperature means in chemistry, is how fast um, atoms and molecules are moving. And what that really tells us is that something is speeding up the small amount of stuff that's in the corona. It's very diffuse. It's not, um, it's not dense like the core of the sun or any parts of the sun. It's very diffuse, but it's moving out at very, very fast speeds. So that million degree corona, maybe I'll talk about that in future science talk. But the key part is we figured out what the sun was made of by just looking at sunlight. And that's how we know what all of the stars are made of, distant stars. And that million degree corona is what I spent five years thinking about. I don't have an answer for you. I have one step further towards the answer, as with any, um, any great project. Uh, and that's, that's what I have for you. The very last slide is all of the image credits. So if you do want these slides, that way you can get to all of them. Um, but otherwise, I'll leave it there. Uh, and thank you. All right, so I saved lots of time for questions. Um, I have a microphone so that the recording will be able to hear your questions. So Tim will bring it around if you have any. But what questions do you have? So you had mentioned, is it working? Hello, hello. Oh, okay. I just need to talk closer. Okay. <laughs> So you had spoke about how they discovered different elements that matched here and the sun. Mm -hmm. Are we able to discover new elements with that method? If we shine it on something that it could create a new element that we were unaware of? So um, there's, there's two parts that we talked about the, the 
burning the stuff in the lab, is that the process you mentioned? Or, okay. Yeah, so if we discovered a, a like rock of something, that wasn't a rock, because that would be geology, but a, a piece of um, solid element of some kind, and we didn't know what it was, we could burn it and see that um, spectrum. There's, there's more fancy methods now, not in the 1800s. But we could, and then we would actually see, oh, this was actually a piece of sodium, or this was a piece of whatever. Um, in terms of the progress we've made from the 1800s to now, we've, we've pretty much found all of the possible how many protons and neutrons are in the core of things to call them different elements. Um, so it's, it's not something where we would be able to find new stuff from there, but we would be able to use that same exact method now to identify something that you picked up and didn't know what it was. Yeah, good question. It's been years since I've been dealing with this. I just wondered, uh, how are the measurements taken? Are, are they still through telescopes on Earth, or do we have, you know, Hubble? I know we had the Hubble telescope, and that probably, you know, jumped a, a couple of uh, levels to help you with that. I just wonder, where is it now, and where are you headed to maybe find more information, more data, and what's out there? Yeah. So. Um before I answer it, just a follow-up question. Measurements of the sun specifically or as astronomy in general? Uh, for the sun. For the sun specifically. Okay. So um, first of all, if we, if we sent Hubble to look at the sun, the rest of astronomy would, would, totally, would totally kill uh, solar physics because that would burn all of the um, sensitive equipment. Hubble's fantastic for astronomy, but the sun is far too bright. What that actually means is we need to have a whole different set of telescopes that are focused specifically on the sun where we have to design them so that they can um, have as fast exposures as possible, which is something that astronomy, it's just like unfathomable, unfathomable to people who are studying something where they're hoping they get like five photons for their experiment. So solar physics is this whole other paradigm, which is really interesting. And it means that we're constantly trying to make sure we have enough uh, telescope power to answer the new types of questions. So in the sort of astronomy type world, um, James Webb Space Telescope, that's a big uh, name that's going to be coming up soon. That's going to replace Hubble for the astronomy, non-solar stuff side of things. Solar Probe Plus just launched like weeks ago. Um, and that is not only going to take um, measurements of the sun by looking at it and analyzing that light, but Solar Probe Plus is actually going to, over the course of the next um, several years, get into an orbit where it's a very, very elliptical orbit. It goes incredibly close to the sun and then really, really far out. And it's actually going to pick up, scoop up the ions and stuff that it's flying through during those close-in passes. That's going to help us understand a lot more of this million degree corona question in a way that would be impossible before that mission. Um, so if you imagine the sun as a basketball, if you put four and a half basketballs away from it, that's as close as Solar Probe Plus is going to get. It's going to get unreasonably, unbelievably close to the sun. And a lot of what they um, did to try to um, make sure that the heat shield could withstand those temperatures was really impressive. Like, there was one where they bought like several IMAX projectors that would all focus in on a single spot just to get the temperatures like at all close. It's a really interesting um, project, and I, I really recommend uh, looking that one up if you want more information on the next stage. That's Solar Probe Plus. That's the very best brand new thing for space-based observatories. But we do have a lot of current ground-based observatories that are really good at um, the visible light part of things and getting useful and important um, pieces of information that we can get from that part of the spectrum. Absolutely. And then um, the newest ground-based solar observatory that's going to be made is uh, called DKIST, D-K-I-S-T, the Daniel K. Inouye. Uh, solar telescope. And so if you want to look that one up, that's going to be the thing that's going to unlock a whole bunch of information too for us um, in the next uh, decade or so. Uh, 
Um, this is sort of a historical technical question. Do you know why they measure, we talk about the wavelengths, or sorry, the light in wavelengths rather than frequency? And I've just been wondering about this because when, when the speed of light changes as we put it through a medium, the frequency is constant, but the wavelength changes. And yet, all our visible spectra, always, we always talk about them in chemistry, and it seems like in astronomy too, as wavelength. But it seems like that would be throwing things off because that could change as you change media. Does that make sense? Yeah, your question makes sense. Um, I don't have an answer okay. for it because I don't know why they picked frequency versus wavelength because you could go with either one. Um, that would be really interesting to try to find where that actually started to take hold as a um, consistent choice that was being made. Yeah, I don't know. Got one up front here. Is there, do we know of how like coronium and iron, that it looks so different when it's heated to that temperature? Are there any other atoms or elements that can survive on the sun as well as here? Yeah, so um, iron is far more um, abundant compared to a lot of the other heavy elements on the sun, which make it a brighter, bigger line. If we look back at the bottom of the slide, the things that make these uh, wider and deeper lines is how much of it there is. So there's more iron than a lot of other things um, for a very important astronomy thing that I won't get into for the answer. But there are lots of these other elements that we see with our current technology, a lot of these very, very high ionization states of in the sun's corona. Yeah, that was just when we think back to being able to just see seven things, we see the seven best things. It's the same idea with the um, emission lines in the corona. If we can only see four of them, then they're going to be the ones that are the best and biggest. Yeah, for sure. Good question. Any other questions? This is just a silly question. Did you get momentarily excited when they shut down the live feed for the sunspot? Observ the solar, solar observatory in, in New Mexico the oh, last yeah. couple of weeks ago, was it, or was it, yeah, it was about. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I, I sort of found out about it after the fact, so, yeah. so no, I didn't like jumpstart my heart or anything. Yeah, like, <laughs> oh, what did they see? Why is the FBI there? What are they doing? Right. The <laughs> yeah. I, I have a couple questions. Yeah. One is, uh, you mentioned the name of a star, Betelgeuse. Uh, yeah. You know, I know species, you know, being a biologist, species are named for weird reasons. Uh, uh, why are stars named? It just, I mean, Betelgeuse, do you know? I'm glad you picked Betelgeuse eh. because uh, the way that I translate it from the Arabic is armpit of the hunter, okay? <laughs> so it's part of Orion, and if you think of Orion's belt, um, Rigel the star is his knee, it's a really big, bright blue star, and Betelgeuse is right here. So people say shoulder, but it's clearly armpit. Um, <laughs> But a lot of our um, names of stars come from ancient cultures that had named them. Most of our constellations come from Greek mythology, but Betelgeuse and a lot of other star names come from Arabic names that existed a long, long time ago. Yeah, great question. I got to say armpit three times. <laughs> nice. uh, and then one more question. You said that our sun uh, is yellow because that is the most abundant um, wavelength of light. Uh, would other suns be different colors, or is it um, okay? Yeah, so um, if you look out in the night sky on a fairly clear night, Orion's actually a really good one to go to. So Orion's belt, people can pretty easily um, see the three really bright stars that even downtown Grand Rapids we can see. That knee star, Rigel, which is lower down, uh, closer to the ground, that actually looks bluer than a lot of the other stars in the sky because it is a blue star, it's making lots and lots of ultraviolet light and far more blue light than it makes red, and so it looks blue. Rigel, uh, Betelgeuse, on the other hand, armpit, fourth time, um, that one looks orangish red, and that's because it's a much colder star. It's still humongous, because it's at the end of its lifetime, but it actually makes a whole lot of um, infrared and red light and not as much blue light. Yeah, and so, our sun makes the most light in green, but your eyes will never see a green star because of the way that colors add up. We can never get something that is making so much more green than anything else um, that it looks green. The, the shape of the curve 
which I'm going to scroll all the way back to when we saw that posted stamp that I want to become, right? That shape of that curve, this is a um, black body curve. It's got a particular shape based on um, a lot of uh, cool physics that I won't get into. But it means that if you shift it left and right, it'll shift up and down based on temperature. Um, and it can never be a shape that's steep enough in the green to look green. But yeah, stars definitely uh, have a whole range of colors, which typically go from bluish white to whitish to whitish or, uh, yellow to yellowish orange to orangish red. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, one last question from Tasha. I don't know if this is related to it, but like the northern lights, how you can see all the different colors, is that the sun and the moon reflecting or what? So that's, that's very much related to, now it's gone, the uh, mo million um, degree corona. So the northern lights is based on what's happening at the sun. And those very high temperatures, which mean really fast speeds, that outflow of material is called the solar wind. So that's actually what I focused five years on, is the solar wind. Um, but when things like the solar wind or solar um, coronal mass ejections, when they actually send electrons towards the Earth from the sun, those electrons hitting our atmosphere is what causes the northern lights. So it's physically stuff in our atmosphere, which, helpfully enough, we have, let's see, in a couple of slides, beautiful, our atmosphere, cloud of gas, and those molecules are being excited because they're being hit with an electron. So they go up to a higher rung, not exactly the same physics, but the same idea. And when they drop back down, they make a particular color. And so the northern lights typically look greenish at certain altitudes because of what stuff's at those altitudes, and pinkish at different altitudes because of what stuff is there. Yeah. That's why they can't be seen everywhere. It has to do with the altitudes. Exactly. It has to do with um, where Earth's magnetic field actually hits the ground. So it's like a big um, ring of possible locations. Yeah. Yeah, when we, see the, when we see the northern lights here in Grand Rapids, that's a bad sign for solar storms and things like that, because they should be much higher north. Yeah, when, when we see them further south, it means Earth's magnetic field has been stripped away, like a, the layers of an onion. It comes back, but for, the, for that period of time, it's, it's not good news. So it's, pre it's pretty, but it's actually the sign of, of something worse. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank yeah. you.